We're looking at the Mark 7 Churchill. In fact, this is not only a, the, the Mark 7, it's the last Churchill ever built. It's got a brass plaque on the turret to advertise that fact. For that reason, it's only got about 11 miles on the clock when anyone last looked. So it's as good as new in every respect. Now, the Churchill was an amazing tank. It goes right back in the early days to 1940-41, when the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, insisted on having a new infantry tank. We'd reached that point in history when the infantry tank was really more in demand than the cruiser tank. And we'd got the whole idea wrong at one point, and uh, Churchill wanted a new one. Frankly, that whether there was really any point is, is difficult to say. But by the time the Mark VII arrived, it was an excellent tank. It had got a 350 horsepower Vauxhall or Bedford flat 12 in the back which gave it a tremendous amount of power within a reasonable way. It had a tremendous climbing ability. They reckon in Tunisia and later in Italy, this thing could go up mountain and goat tracks that no other tank could climb. And that set it in a, a realm apart in that sense. It's got a rather odd suspension. It's individual flanged bogies with coil springs, but the flanged bogies are metal rimmed. They've got no rubber on them at all. So it's rather noisy when it's going along, and a lot of that noise gets inside. But it, it works quite well. Now the tanks are all welded construction, and what makes it outstanding is that across the front, the frontal armour in front of the driver there, is 152 millimetres thick. That's actually thicker armour than on the Tiger but over a much smaller area, of course, which makes quite a difference. As I said, it's powered by the um, Vauxhall Bedford 350 horsepower engine. It's driving through a Merritt Brown gearbox at the back. So all the driving and gear changing takes place behind the driver, which makes that difficult. But it's an interesting vehicle. It has a crew of five, that is driver, hull machine gunner, and then the three-man turret crew typically the loader, the gunner, and the, of course the tank commander. So from that point of view, it's very effective. Now, what we've actually got here, although it's the last Churchill gun tank, we're actually displaying it as a Churchill crocodile, which is the Churchill flamethrower. And for that reason, you've got the flamethrower hood attached to the, mount, the machine gun mounting in the front of the tank here. Normally, you'd have an open mounting with a bees of machine gun in it. But now you've got this flamethrower attachment. That's on. The flamethrower is mounted mostly in a trailer at the back, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the fuel is piped under the floor of the tank, up through the floor by the flamethrower gunner and into the back of the flamethrowing weapon. The flamethrower itself is a wasp-type flamethrower with a range of about, ooh, about 100 metres on a good day, which is quite effective. And they make a tremendous noise when they're flaming, so they're quite frightening. The trailer, which is towed behind the tank, is attached to the tank by amazing articulated sort of coupling, so that the tank can go across country still. It's armoured to about 12 millimetre standard, so it'll keep out small arms fire, but nothing bigger, so the tank has to use itself to shield the trailer as much as possible. The trailer is filled with 400 gallons of flame fuel. Now, 400 gallons, it's a very thick stuff because they like the flame. They, what they like to do is squirt it like a jet and then set it alight later. So it becomes more devastating like that. And that's propelled by nitrogen in cylinders. There's five of them packed in the trailer as well. So the whole lot of fill, fill the trailer completely. The idea was to separate the men in the tank from the actual source of the flame that's bad enough where it comes up through the tank anyway. But um, that's how they operated the flamethrower. And it works by pressure. The only trouble was the pressure tended to leak. If you left the thing standing for half an hour, the pressure would disappear. It would just leak out. And the flame, when it's going, you're lucky if you can get half a minute out of it, actually. You, you normally fired in bursts. You didn't fire continuous belts of flame because that used up the flame even quicker. But uh, they were very, very frightening and impressive vehicles. Flame actually won't do that much harm, but 
it's psychological. We're all feared of flame, and the sight of this thing coming towards you, belching flame, put most people off. You've got more surrendered than were ever wiped out by flame because they didn't like it. They didn't like the pressure of it. And in fact, they, they say that the crews of the flamethrower tanks were often shot by the Germans when they were captured because they didn't like them and they didn't like the flames that they squirted out. Not that the Germans didn't have flamethrowers as well, but they weren't quite as nasty as this one. As a gun tank, very effective in its own way. The gun isn't really a patch on the, the later German tanks, but that's typical. And that's the Churchill and the, the Churchill Crocodile, which is a flame-throwing version. 